Welcome to online worship from Dunkeld for the 8th of August. Normally I would do some of the service outside, maybe record the introduction in the grounds or whatever, but today the nice weather's abandoned us and it's heavy rain, so I'm taking refuge inside the building. But this week I'm returning to the same story we looked at last time, which is the story of the prophet Nathan confronting King David about his wrongdoing. We're not going to hear the passage again. If you want to hear it, it's in last week's recording, or you can find it in 2 Samuel chapter 12. But it might be useful to fill in a wee bit of the story before we begin. David was the greatest king Israel had ever had, ascending to the throne after King Saul went off the rails, and David had been anointed by God as the next king through the prophet Samuel. But then there was that occasion when David was in the palace and he saw Bathsheba bathing and he wanted her. And being king, he figured he could have what he wanted. Trouble is, she was married to one of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. It's a real story worthy of the tabloids because Bathsheba ends up pregnant and David begins a path of corruption to try and cover his tracks. So he gets Uriah back from the battle line on the pretext that the king wants a report of how things are going. And while he's home, he'll bundle Uriah off back to his own house and and give him a few days off and then be able to pass off the baby as Uriah's own. But David didn't reckon with Uriah's loyalty to his men. The soldiers are back at the front. Uriah's come back to Jerusalem, he's not going to enjoy home comforts while his men are struggling in the battle, so he won't do that. So David gets him drunk, plying with alcohol, think he'll then be able to persuade him home, but to no avail. Uriah won't oblige. So Uriah goes back to battle, and then David's plans take a more evil turn. He sends word through a commander that Uriah is to be put in the the worst part of the battle and at the crucial moment, everyone else pull back a bit and leave him. And then word comes back that Uriah has been killed. It's really quite chilling to see, if you read chapter 11, the length David goes to, to plot to cover up his wrongdoing, double standards and deception are rife. But the important thing for David, though, is that Uriah is now out of the way. The way is cleared for him to marry Bathsheba and avoid scandal. But it's at that point Nathan comes to David and challenges him. He lures him in cleverly with a story about a rich man who's got loads of sheep and cattle, and he steals a poor man's one sheep to give food to his guests. David's outraged, judges the man, and Nathan says, you are that man. You've got everything you could want, and yet you did this with Bathsheba and Uriah. So it's a story about power. That was the main point last week, the use and abuse of power. How we use power in our own lives, not just to powerful people, but ordinary folk in our daily lives. There's always a temptation to seek to manipulate and control others. But today I want to move on from that, to move it a wee bit closer to home. What does this say about the man, David? And therefore, what does it say about our nature as we seek to follow Christ? David, despite his flaws, was a very gifted man. One of his great gifts was poetry and music, and many of the Psalms are attributed to him. So it's appropriate we begin with perhaps the most famous of them all, the 23rd Psalm. So let us worship God. The Lord is my shepherd.
At the end of this whole sorry saga of David and Bathsheba, David repents in sorrow at what he's done. We're told in Psalm 51, in the short introduction to this psalm, that it was written after Nathan confronted David. And you can certainly catch his mood in these words. God be gracious to me in your faithful love. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out my misdeeds. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For well I know my misdeeds and my sins confront me all the time. Against you only have I sinned and have done what displeases. You are right when you accuse me and justified in passing sentence. From my birth I have been evil, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You desire faithfulness in the inmost being, so teach me wisdom in my heart. God, create a pure heart for me and give me a new and steadfast spirit. Let us pray. Ancient words and ancient stories which still speak to us today because, Lord, the human condition has not changed. We too stand in awe before the wonder of the created world at a beautiful sunset or the magnificence of mountains and rivers. Blessings from your hand, Creator God. We too are chastened to think of our weaknesses, ill-chosen words, harboured bitterness, barely concealed impatience with the faults of others. We too crave forgiveness and stand in need of healing and restoration through Jesus Christ. We too long to be different and seek a fresh start through your strength. Fill us a new Holy Spirit, create in us a pure heart, singleness of purpose to honour you in our words here, as well as what we do in the week ahead. Start within us. Speak to the situations we bring before you and help us leave all that burdens us at your feet. Then as we are renewed and forgiven, may we be inspired to worship and serve. We offer you our worship now and ourselves. Because in every age, you are the one who has called people and equipped them to follow through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Humbly in your sight we come together, Lord. Grant us now the blessing of your presence here. The
Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge and you will not be judged. For as you judge others, so you yourselves will be judged. And whatever measure you deal out to others will be dealt to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye with never a thought for the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's. Last time then, I concentrated mainly on how this story relates to people with power, people like King David. In a way, they are an easy target. They are distant. They are people who take a lead, therefore they stick their heads above the parapet and they're uh, easy to hit. And if they go wrong, well, they're fair game. So they're bad and it's all about them. But that's to deflect attention away from ourselves and it makes things far too easy for us because this is also about you and me. It's about who holds the reins of power in my life and how each of us relates to other people, either by looking out for them or by trying to manipulate them for our own ends. And to that extent, it's a story about self-deception and self-awareness. David had his image to maintain, his public face. Like the rest of us, he probably had a self-image as well in his mind of what he thought he was like. And what he had done with Bathsheba shattered that illusion. The public image business he can deal with and tries to by compounding the wrong. The self-image thing is not so easy to run away from because he knew what he had done and it would probably rise up to accuse him and erupt in some strange way, unpredictable direction later in life. So Nathan gets behind the defences David has erected and gets him to condemn himself. By judging another man, the rich man in the story, he ends up judging himself. It's Matthew chapter 7 stuff. Don't look for the speck of dust in your, your neighbour's eye when you've got a great sock and plank in your own. As a king, David had to sit in judgment over others. I wonder what he thought as he did that, as he remembered his own wrong. Did he block it out? Did he pretend it hadn't happened? But we're all good at that. Like the person in public life who makes pronouncements about what people should do and shouldn't do, and then the press discover that that person was up to no good themselves all along. What they were condemning in others, they were doing themselves. So they may be condemned benefits cheats while creaming off extra expenses or whatever it may be. We know the kind of thing. But there I go again, shoving it away to refer to other people when it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. We're all good at it, at self-deception, pretending that we are something we are not. I always go back to the early stories in Genesis which present us in story form with a very um, full and, and almost humorous picture of what we human beings are like with a lot of wisdom along the way. So when Adam and Eve break the rule they're not meant to break and they eat the apple, what's their first reaction? Deception. They hide. They are exposed. So they hide their nakedness in the bushes when God comes looking for them. They cover their tracks. No one need know that we've done this. We'll, we'll get away with it. And so the story of humanity begins, of wrongdoing, covering ourselves so that no one need know what we've done. And mostly we are successful in that front. The story of evading the truth about ourselves, which we can do to an extent. And trying to act all innocent with God, which will never work. So when Adam and Eve 
are, are tackled. Adam blames Eve. It was the woman you gave me who made me do it. And Eve blames the snake. It was the snake, Lord. In fact, the snake that you gave us. So in a roundabout way, Lord, it's kind of your fault. And self-deception reigns. And it still goes on. Our litigious culture today is built on the same kind of thing. You know, from time to time you read a just crazy story in the press of someone who sues for some bizarre reason. Some workman didn't fill in a wee hole in a path and you fell and it's terrible and the man must be made to pay. Or someone who dropped the ham sandwich that you slipped on and caused yourself a mischief. And so someone is to blame, but it's not me. And the other side is that you can't admit culpability and say sorry, because to do that is to admit your liability and you're for the high jump. So the injured party can't accept that it was perhaps partly their fault too and move on. And we can all slip into that. Have you never read or heard something or heard a thought and you've thought to yourself, I wish my neighbour was here to hear that. It's just what he needs. And it might well be, but again, it's to shove it away from myself and think, well, it doesn't apply to me. It applies to somebody else, to so-and-so who needs to hear it. So David can see the flaw in his neighbour, in this man in the story, while conveniently ignoring the similar flaw in himself. In fact, we can feel better about ourselves by pointing out the flaws of others and therefore building up our own self-esteem by doing them down. And of course, we do have to make judgments, just as Nathan clearly did. So long as we understand that we too are part of the problem, that we are all in need of mercy and we can all stop our self-deception and stop looking for the speck of sawdust in our neighbour's eye once we understand there's a great big plank in our own. It's to get to the point that St Paul did in Romans chapter 7, where he becomes painfully aware of his own fallibility and he cries out, wretched creature that I am, who will deliver me from this state of death? Who but God? Thanks be to him through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The capacity for self-deception that we see in David is there to one degree or another in all of us. The self-awareness is to be open to your own flaws, to know that we are in need of Christ's mercy and compassion every bit as much as the next man or woman and understanding that, understanding that there is a log in our own eye, is the only basis in which we can function as a Christian community, realising that we all need to be forgiven and to forgive. Ephesians chapter 4. I implore you then, I, a prisoner for the Lord's sake, as God has called you, live up to your calling. Be humble always and gentle and patient too, putting up with one another's failings in the spirit of love. Spare no effort to make fast with bonds of peace the unity which the spirit gives. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope held out in God's call to you. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But each of us has been given a special gift, a particular share in the bounty of Christ. And it is he who has given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip God's people for work in his service for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity inherent in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, to mature to manhood, measured by nothing less than the full stature of Christ. 
We are no longer to be children tossed about by the waves and whirled around by every fresh gust of teaching, dupes of cunning rogues and their deceitful schemes. Rather, we are to maintain the truth in a spirit of love. So we shall fully grow up into Christ. He is the head and on him the whole body depends, bonded and held together by every constituent joint, the whole frame grows through the proper functioning of each part and builds itself up in love. It's interesting to try and piece together the inner processes David might have gone through in this incident. For one thing, I wonder what would have happened had Nathan gone straight in, all guns blazing, and told the king just what he thought of him. Because it's often the case that to be confronted like that just makes a person more stubborn, less likely to give in. We don't like taking a telling, and who is he or she to tell me what to do? But Nathan very cleverly draws David in to judging himself, rather than doing the job for him. And is that not the stage we all need to reach as well, to grasp within ourselves what's wrong? Because when others try and tell us, well, we might not believe them and we will maybe resist them. But when we see it for ourselves, then it's real. We understand what we are like. The other thing about David I wonder about here is what would have happened if Nathan had never confronted him at all? Would he have continued pretending and thinking his wrong had been successfully hidden? Are we only truly sorry if we're found out? And if no one knows, well, we are not that bothered. Do you never feel with someone in public life who's dragged before the cameras to confess and say sorry because they've been a naughty boy or girl? You know full well they don't mean it. Are they truly sorry or are they just sorry they were caught out? So having proclaimed their mea culpas, they then slip into the background until some point in the future when they can come back into the limelight again. So it's not that we all want our wrongs paraded in full view of everyone else, that would be horrific, but we do need to face up to the truth about ourselves. And this is the positive thing about David here. He could have had Nathan severely dealt with, but deep down, he is a man of God. He had done wrong and he knew it. And because he began to believe he was invincible, he thought he could do what he liked. But when he's caught out, he holds his hands up and repents. This much is clear from the words he writes in Psalm 51. But as well as exposing the problems with human nature, the story also shows us a way forward, and it comes in two stages. First of all, there's penitence. Like David, we need to be able to admit our faults. Being self-aware and knowing what we are like is to know that we are in need of mercy from God, which we find in Christ. So admit it and we can move on. And the second stage then is a change of heart, a complete change in the way we view ourselves and each other in the body of Christ. What is needed is a different way of doing and being altogether. And that's the only basis on which we can relate to others and live in a community, realizing that we need to forgive because we all need to be forgiven. You see, it's not really folk who make mistakes that are the problem, actually. It's people who make mistakes and can't see the bigger picture, which is that we all go wrong from time to time. We all make mistakes, but we all belong in the one body, the body of Christ. And the only way for that body to function, for a Christian community to exist, is to follow the pattern of Christ. And that's the plea of Ephesians chapter 4. Spare no effort to make fast with bonds of peace the unity which the Spirit gives. Be humble and gentle and patient. The pattern is in Christ. 
that we know we, having been shaken out of our self-deception, having received mercy from Christ, as a church we are meant to model that new way and show a different way of living, to be a sign of hope to a fractured world, to a broken world. If we don't grasp that bigger picture, we become harsh and judgmental of others because we have no self-awareness of our own need of forgiveness. So why should we extend that to others when they have gone wrong in their own stupidity? When we grasp this different understanding, as Paul outlines it, in Christ, then we become more compassionate because we understand our own need of compassion. That's how we've been treated. So does this story not just show what a strange mix we human creatures are? David is skilled and capable and a great leader and, and gifted, but also flawed, also capable of selfish and damaging behaviour. And we are such a mix. But in Christ we are made new. And on the cross, he took that brokenness of the world, our brokenness, that we might be made whole. to see that though I fail you every day your steadfast love will not fail me but gladly bears my sin away and there I see your holy fire consuming sin in mercy's blood what righteousness and love require to ransom sinners to their God Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to weep For there my sin led you away And in the sun did bow in grief As darkness crowned our darkest day and oh, to think that I once stood Indifferent to your suffering And oh, to see your sweat like blood Such depths of sorrow born for me Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to love for there I've tasted love divine It fills my heart with power enough To make your costly service mine No sin too great to meet with grace No enemy too foul to bless Your love and wounds of sacrifice Teach me, O oh Lord, to love like this Your cross, O oh Lord, taught me to sing For now my captive soul is free No guilt, no fear, no suffering Can tear away your love from me No song can reach such heights of joy. No tongue can tell such depths of peace. No power, no time can e'er destroy the eternal praise for Calvary.
Lord Jesus, we see your love in outstretched hands on the cross, love abused, your body broken, by people who thought they were so right they would not be told, and would stop at nothing to be rid of what stood in their way. In the world still, people are abused, driven from their homes, bombed in marketplaces, by people who are so sure they are right, they will stop at nothing. Save our world from such madness. In Afghanistan and Syria and Yemen and Belarus and many others. Save us from such narrow-mindedness and suffering. And may the gospel of love ring out from your people in Jesus' name. In the world still we see people so oblivious to right and wrong, they will abuse others, commit crimes, act only in their own narrow self-interest. We pray for people who are afraid in their homes and communities, for those who protect our communities and the police, for those who populate our prisons, that you would heal and restore. We pray for those whose lives have suddenly plunged into darkness because of bad news about illness or that accident on the A9 this week or broken relationships or lost employment. And for those who struggle to love themselves because of guilt or failure, we pray. In ourselves, what do we see? You, Lord, know our needs, and we know to trust you. So hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, in Jesus' name. And in the words he taught us to say, we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.